Hi, this is Mark Birch, and this is the second part of my revision of John Burnside's poem, History, from Poems of the Decade, an anthology of the forward books of poetry. The four lines, beginning at times, suddenly impose a structural regularity to the poem. They're presented in regular iambic pentameter and represent the way in which the poetic voice attempts to impose order on the world by rationalising it, proposing a form of existential philosophy. Our identity is not based on kinship nor our given states. This is the kind of identity that tends to divide because it's based on contrast and may link to the conflict between America and Al-Qaeda. Instead, identity is something lost between the world we own and what we dream about. The world we own may be a reference to materialism and identity based on possession, while what we dream about appears to refer to desires. What's lost could be the present, the today that begins the poem. We lose sight of what's truly precious as we constantly strive for more. Burnside suggests that materialism imprisons us rather than liberates us. The semantic field of imprisonment is employed in language such as fixed, anchored, confined, tethers, and the connection to materialism is made explicit in the phrase confined by property. Our lines raised in the wind refers once again to the image of the kite and may function as a metaphor for the existential inquiry that Burnside considers. While we are fixed and anchored to the shore, we're connected to the kite by the line, a liminal feature that could represent the space between that which we possess and that which we desire. This is the true self of the present, but one that's often lost through our pursuit of the material. Lines functions as a homographic pun, given its variety of meanings. Kites are normally tethered by strings, so the use of lines may be to allude to the variety of other lines that humans impose on the landscape, telephone lines, power lines, etc. This provides another element to the theme of the natural versus the artificial. Gravity and light seem to function as contrasts, with gravity associated with a force that pulls down into the earth, while light suggests a weightlessness or element of the air. While gravity could mirror the bodies fixed and anchored to the shore, light may refer to the kite raised in the wind. Again, it's what separates and connects these two, the liminal space that truly tethers us. It's this space that's occupied by nature. We may find ourselves by reading from the book of silt and tides and recognising our own place in the world. Again, the sensory nature of this image is captured by the almost tidal movement of the lines back and forth across the page. Nature is presented as beautiful, but also fragile. The jellyfish is rose or petrol blue, and given the poem's earlier reference to that gasoline smell from Lucas, the sense of marine nature suffering from industrial pollution seems clear. Again, everything is connected. This is made explicit in the descriptions of the sea life combining with a child's first nakedness. The vulnerability of nature parallels that of a child, which the poetic voice recognises through an appreciation of the connection between the child and the marine world that the child explores. Silt and tides are ephemeral. They're the legacy of something that's already passed. In the wake of 9-11, many people around the world recognised their own vulnerability and an international innocence was lost. Human life is itself ephemeral. Burnside returns to iambic pentameter in the reflective lines that follow this. The methodical structure offers a profound contrast to the preceding lines and suggests the gravity of the points being made. The poetic voice is dizzy with the fear of losing the natural world. The scale of the loss is conveyed through the asyndetic list, with the structure's lack of a conjunction providing a sense of endlessness. This loss could come about through pollution and the abuse of the natural environment, or through the kind of war that the 9-11 attacks represent. Burnside suggests that we lose these things in order to know the virtual. The oxymoronic nature of knowing something that's not fully realised hints at the fruitlessness of such a pursuit. We sacrifice everything for something worthless. While not defined, the nature of the virtual could be the artificial world of material products. We lose sight of the natural world in pursuit of possessions, film, TV, gaming, and more recently the internet. As a result, we scarcely register the drift and tug of other bodies. We lose social relationships. It's interesting that Burnside conveys this through the semantic field of the tides, with drift and tug 
representing the relationship with nature as well as other humans. Again, the loss of focus on the present is stressed through scarcely apprehend the moment as it happens. The repetition of scarcely reinforces the impoverished nature of humanity's perception of the world. History could be described as the study of the past, but its focus tends to be on events that we consider monumental. This focus prevents us appreciating the small changes, or as Burnside refers to them, the local forms of history that are occurring before our eyes. Burnside explores this idea further through various images of fish, extending the images of the beach and water presented earlier in the poem. A common theme seems to be one of entrapment, echoing the imprisonment conveyed by the image of the kite. The first image of fish lodged in the tide beyond the sands provides a clear link between the immediate beach image and the theme of entrapment. These are creatures trapped by time, frozen in a moment. The concepts taken further by the captive ornamental carp in public parks. These creatures are objects selected for display, nature corrupted by humanity and effectively imprisoned as our possessions. They and we are confined by property. The carp are described as suffering a long insomnia. Their restlessness in confinement may mirror humanity's own restless pursuit of desire rather than acceptance of the liminal state of the present. The mathematical notion of transitive may reinforce this sense of the connection between the fish and humanity. Just as transitive mathematical relationships convey a relation that exists between different elements, so here the same sense of entrapment exists between fish and humanity. Finally, Burnside introduces the most commonly recognised captivity of the aquatic, jam jars filled with frog spawn or sticklebacks by small children. He also refers to the goldfish that were given as prizes in small bags at fairgrounds. The goldfish and the transitive gold of the carp represent something valuable and prized for appearance. They may represent the way in which humanity robs nature to supplement the need for possession. Burnside concludes the poem with the environmental problem of how to live in the world without damaging it. He returns to the central images of the poem, the parent and child on the beach playing in rock pools and flying a kite. These may represent attempts to engage with the world positively, living in the moment. Even here, however, the kite is metaphorically plugged into the sky. It's reminiscent of the poet's warning of the appeal of the virtual. This is complemented by the line that could allude not only to the string of the kite, but to a phone line, providing the terrible news of the world, or indeed a fishing line, reinforcing the sense of humanity taking fish from their natural environment. The final line may offer some hope. If we are attentive to the irredeemable, we may appreciate nature and time as it passes. We may accept the liminal state of our existence. Irredeemable has biblical connotations, given the epithet sometimes applied to Jesus, Christ the Redeemer. This captures the sense of Jesus having died in order to atone for the sins of humanity, providing essentially a second chance. While the poem ends on the word irredeemable, it doesn't seem pessimistic, given that there is hope that by appreciating that which cannot be redeemed, we may value it more highly. The final line may also function as an intertextual link to T.S. Eliot's The Four Quartets, Burnt Norton. Here Eliot states that all time is unredeemable, and it's this notion that renders time so precious. We need to cherish the world rather than destroy it in the way that's so poignantly experienced on this day of history. Okay, tough.